So tonight's speaker, he will be talking about parrotfish. And parrotfish are beautiful fish, but they're much more than just a pretty face. Joshua Manning is here to explain the role these helpful herbivores play on our reefs. Joshua is an early career ecologist with a background in coral reef ecology. His recent work has centered on the importance of animal movement and space in mediating species interactions and the responses of marine animals to human stressors. He has spent hundreds of hours underwater studying parrotfish movement and behavior on the coral reefs of Bonaire to provide a holistic understanding of parrotfish ecology. So now, turn your pretty faces towards the screen and welcome Joshua. All right, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone for coming. I know the weather's not perfect, but uh, hopefully you'll learn a little bit about parrotfish, why they're important to coral reefs, and a bit more about parrotfish movement and why that's important for understanding their roles on coral reefs. All right. So coral reefs are structurally complex ecosystems built by corals and other calcifying organisms. These impressive structures support vibrant uh, communities of fish, invertebrates, and other organisms. And they provide coastline protection from damaging storms, like the one we almost experienced recently. Um, and their fisheries support millions of people worldwide. However, coral reefs are increasingly uh, degraded by several human stressors, including local stressors like overfishing and eutrophication, as well as global stressors like climate change. And this degradation is leading to shifts in the benthic functional uh, groups and composition of coral reefs from coral dominated states like the one shown here on the left to more uh, degraded states dominated by fleshy macroalgae, uh, in some cases cyanobacteria and other benthic organisms. And these shifts can have negative effects on reef function and health. And at local scales, grazing by nominally herbivorous fishes, like parrotfishes, is considered important in preventing these shifts. So parrotfish are prolific grazers uh, on coral reefs that ex have historically been considered um, important for maintaining healthy coral reefs, primarily by removing algae from the reef. As such, management efforts have largely focused on protecting uh, parrotfishes and maintaining their populations. However, recent work has suggested that few species actively target macroalgae. There are some that do tend to consume macroalgae, um, but most species actually target uh, cyanobacteria and other small microscopic algae within and on top of the reef substrate, so within this dead coral substrate. And recently, a group of researchers in New Zealand uh, have conducted a lot of research looking into this and have found that uh, cyanobacteria are the dominant component of all substrates targeted by uh, parrotfishes on coral reefs. And they've also found that despite it being the main component of all parrotfishes' diets, these parrotfish do partition where they forage for this resource. And so on this plot on the right, it's pretty complicated, but it's actually fairly simple. Um, we're looking at the diversification of parrotfishes along multiple axes, and these axes are related to different uh, components of the benthic substrate. And so parrotfishes, some parrotfishes like to target recently dead coral with sparse turf algae. Other parrotfishes like to target later successional substrates that are a little more eroded, um, that have more of this thick turf and others will target highly eroded um, substrates that are crumbly, um, and it's easier for them to access the cyanobacteria that are growing within that substrate. And perhaps one of the more specialized species, Scarispinus, shown here, uh, takes almost all of its bites on crustose coralline algae. So crustose coralline algae is another important uh, calcifying organism on coral reefs that facilitates the uh, it stabilizes the reef substrate, it consolidates the reef substrate, and it builds these. Uh, it helps to construct the reef, and it's also an important settlement substrate for corals, uh, some species. And so this parrotfish almost exclusively forages for cyanobacteria on top of crustose coral and algae. So there's a lot of diversity on where these parrotfish are getting their resources from, um, but they're all targeting this one thing, this benthic cyanobacteria. And in addition to targeting cyanobacteria in the turf and substrate bound communities, uh, many Caribbean species uh, we found also go after this benthic cyanobacterial mats. 
And in Bonaire, these benthic cyanobacterial mats are proliferating on the reefs, and they have been for the last uh, 40 years or so. So these benthic cyanobacterial mats, you can see here, um, they're this reddish color. Um, they grow in multiple different colors and morphotypes. But four of the species that I study uh, pretty heavily have been found to consume these benthic cyanobacterial mats preferentially. So they take uh, sometimes upwards of 10% of their bites on these substrates. So they could be really important in controlling the proliferation of these cyanobacterial mats on reefs, which uh, can, when they do start to spread, uh, overgrow corals and other benthic organisms. And although parrot fishes may not be important in removing and controlling macroalgae on coral reefs, their grazing does act as a disturbance that frees up bare space on the reef substrate, and it maintains these crop states that are also conducive for coral settlement and recruitment. So as the juvenile corals are moving around on the reef, they're looking for areas to settle. They do like microhabitat, micro crevices, so these grazing marks by parrot fishes um, that maintain this early successional state can help to promote coral recruitment. And as such, parrotfish grazing may still play an important role in mediating or uh, resisting phase shifts and helping to promote coral recruitment. And in addition to targeting benthic substrates, many species also target uh, feces from planktivorous reef fish in the water column. So this is a study that I recently conducted or uh, published. But four of the species that I study in the Caribbean, and this is a little bit blurry here, so it's a little harder to see, they do like to eat the feces of planktivorous reef fish. And you can see an example of this over on the right. This is a video of a princess parrotfish swimming through the water column and consuming these feces. And in some instances, they'll follow individual fish until they evacuate their bowels and consume it straight from the source. And despite being a relatively infrequent component of their, their diet, so it's less than 5% of their total bites, um, these species are actually highly nutritious and nutritionally valuable to the parrotfishes. They contain more proteins and lipids than most of the benthic resources that they target. Um, and few bites on these uh, feces can actually um, promote or help their nutrition. Yeah? So, like, do they actively follow them to scare them? I don't think they're trying to scare them, <laughs> um, but they, they will follow. And you do see it very often, they will follow them. And I think they can just tell that it's about to happen, and they're there and ready to go. <laughs> do they eat their own as well? <laughs> huh? Do they eat their own feces as well? So the question is, do they eat their own feces as well? And the answer is no. And I'm going to get to that here in a second. So parrotfish feces are not very nutritious. Um, they're mostly sand. And so as parrotfish uh, graze, they remove calcium carbonate from the reef substrate. So they're grazing on this dead coral substrate. They're taking in uh, a lot of this calcium carbonate. And then they have a specialized pharyngeal mill that grinds all that substrate up, and it turns it into sand. So all of that, so that parrotfish is pooping right there, is a very fine sediment that it's producing. Um, it has very little pro uh, protein or lipids or anything else that are valuable to any fish, and most fish will not eat this. There are some species that will eat some other, par uh, other fish poop, but never parrotfish. Um, and in many places, these fine feces are extremely important for the uh, white sand beaches that many of us enjoy. So it's clear that parrotfishes are critical to a healthy coral reef ecosystem. Um, but what really excites me about parrotfishes is how they move and use space. And so during my PhD, I spent over 500 hours underwater following these fish around um, and observing them as they move from place to place, grazing, um, pooping, and interacting with other organisms on the reef. And I became really ex interested in how movement and space use might influence their uh, functional role in coral reefs. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus a little bit on this movement. And uh, hopefully, you'll get an understanding for why, under or why studying their movement and space use is so important for understanding their functional roles on coral reefs. So this part of the talk is going to get a little heavier on the math. Not really. Um, but I'll try to explain everything pretty well. But movement ecology is a relatively new field of ecology focused on understanding the causes and consequences of animal movement. And movement arises from individual decisions based on why an animal wants to move. So is it moving to go find food? Uh, where it's moving, so is it going to a nice foraging patch or is it looking for a shelter, um, but also how it's moving. So is it moving quickly, is it going to fly if it's a bird, is it going to walk, um, and all of these things are 
decisions that an animal makes as it's moving through its environment. So animal movement itself can also influence the environment. So as an animal is moving through its environment, the movement itself can feed back to alter the environment that the animal is perceiving and therefore affect how it's moving. So there's a cycle here um, and some, some feedbacks in animal movement and the environment itself. And so movement occurs at multiple spatial and temporal scales. So it's, it's happening at every level. So you can look here and uh, at the top, the, you could look at the individual movement steps an animal is making in response to its microhabitat. So as it's moving, is it taking a step this way or a step this way? And why is it doing that? Uh, you can broaden out a little bit. You could look at different phases of movement. So you can look at periods when the animal is foraging. So it's moving around in the same area of foraging or escaping a predator. And you can also look, in some cases, at the entire lifetime track of an animal. Um, and this is much easier for things that live for a short amount of time, but you can do it. And so as many ecological processes are scale dependent, studies of animal movements can help us to identify the scales at which we need to study specific uh, ecological processes and patterns. And so my research is largely focused on stationary movements that give rise to home ranges. And home ranges are areas in which an animal um, carries out its daily activities. And this is foraging, mating, things like that. Um, these home ranges are self-restricted areas, and they are also stationary. So not stationary in terms of they're not moving at all, but when they're moving, they're staying in the same general area. So if we look at this example on the right of a buffalo's movement track throughout a day or a, a period of time, you can see that there are six different phases where the animal is pretty much moving in the same place. Um, and one area under B there where it's moving in a directed way towards a different area. So stationarity basically implies that the animal is moving, but it's moving within the same general area for a given amount of time. And that depends on the window that you're looking at and, and what time scale you're interested in. So home ranges are commonly estimated using what's called a utilization distribution. Uh, utilization distribution is basically a fancy way of saying the, pro the probability of finding an animal in a given location. Um, and classically, we've used location-based kernel density estimation to do this. And for this, we treat the independent GPS points that we get from tracking as independent locations. So we're assuming that this animal is just there independently of anywhere else it's been in the past. And we place these kernels over each of these locations, and we sum those to estimate the probability of finding an animal in a given spot. However, animal relocations are typically correlated. So as it's moving through its environment, where it was before dictates where it's going, and where it's going dictates where it is, kind of. Um, and so this is particularly true with modern GPS tracking, where you get relocations very frequently. So more and more now, we can get uh, second scale accuracy in locations, and we can get a lot of data on uh, the movement of animals. And these methods may not accurately capture home range behavior. So there's multiple methods that have accounted for the correlation between where an animal is and where it's going, and have provided for a better metric of space use. And one of those is called movement-based kernel density estimation. And in this method, um, you're basically accounting for the time spent between these two known GPS location points, and you're estimating where it's possible that that animal could have gone. So by knowing the amount of time it's spent between those two places, you can estimate where realistically it could have gone and estimate a more accurate, um, get a more accurate estimate of space use. All right, back to the fun stuff. So we're going to move away from the, the math, but now that you know how they're estimated, the rest of this is going to make a lot more sense. So in many animals, individuals or groups may defend all or a portion of their home range as a territory. Territories are fixed areas where an animal maintains priority access to resources through social interaction. And this social interaction doesn't necessarily need to be aggressive. That's a common misconception with territoriality. It can be passive, as is the case with the Aribi antelope. So in African savannas, these antelopes will go around and they scent mark their territories. They use their dung mounds and their urine to mark the boundaries of their territories. Um, so that's a social interaction maintaining a priority access to an area. But they can be very aggressive. So if any of you, I'm assuming most of you have dove on a coral reef now. Um, if you've come across a damselfish, you know they'll defend their territory at any cost against anything. Uh, doesn't matter how big it is, right? Even humans. 
Um, so it can be very aggressive, but it doesn't need to be. So movement and space use can also mediate how species interact with one another. So spatiotemporal segregation, so this is basically uh, avoiding one another in space and time, uh, can facilitate coexistence of competing species by limiting competition between them. An example of this is the sable antelope shown here on the left. So in the sable antelope, they tend to avoid areas that are frequented by their main competitors, the zebra and the buffalo. So they use areas that are not used as extensively by these other two competitors in order to coexist in the same places. And this um, avoidance is dynamic. So as there are seasonal shifts in resource availability, it will shift how it's using space in order to avoid those competitors. And that helps them to coexist in these ecosystems. So it's clear that spatial interactions can be important in uh, understanding species interactions, but how do we quantify them? So spatial interactions can be either static or dynamic. So static meaning that they don't change through time, or dynamic, they change through time. Um, static interactions measure, uh, act as a proxy for um, the probability of two animals to meet based on their shared space use. Right? So in this example here, we have two individuals and they share a certain area in the center, right? And you can see that they share some space there. But it seems like one of those, if you look at the darker areas within each of those home ranges, the darker area represents more activity. So the individual on the right has more, is more active in that shared area than the one on the left. So you might expect to see some potential for interaction here, but not nearly as much as if the individual on the left also was very active in that area. So in this case, they share the same area of overlap, the area doesn't change, but the amount of activity that they're both spending in those areas does change. And that increases the probability that those two animals are going to meet and potentially interact with one another. And if you're able to simultaneously track two or more individuals at the same time, um, you can also investigate dynamic interactions. And dynamic interactions allow you to determine if an animal is avoid, uh, avoiding another one. Uh, if they're moving independently or if they're moving uh, together. So they could be moving jointly, going to the same resource, things like that. Well, let's take it back to parrotfish. So why, um, why might we want to study spatial interactions in parrotfish? So spatial interactions, as we've sh I've shown, can help to uh, determine how animals interact with one another, and it can also facilitate coexistence between competing species. And there are a lot of species of parrotfish, and it's interesting to try to understand how they coexist on the same reefs. And so first I want to introduce how parrotfish use space uh, on the reef before I get into the spatial interaction component. But parrotfish are protogenous hermaphrodites. That means they transition from female to male at some point in their life. They don't have to, but some do. Um, and the females and males often have two distinct color phases, termed initial and terminal phase. So the initial phase are the females. Uh, they tend to be a little drabber in color. Uh, the terminal phase of the males, they tend to be larger and more colorful. And so each of these species, most species, have uh, sexually dimorphic life phases, uh, initial and terminal. And territoriality is common in many uh, parrotfish species. In territorial uh, individuals, territorial males will defend harems of females from neighboring uh, males of the same species. And territorial males uh, have more access to resources and also are more likely to mate with females than non-territorial individuals. So territoriality is beneficial to parrotfish, but it does come at a cost. Um, being territorial does reduce your body condition, but you do get to uh, mate more often. And my recent work found that the home ranges of male parrotfishes, and I've mapped a few of these over here, um, correspond to nearly exclusive territories that are maintained through uh, long periods of time. And so on the right here, I'm showing the home ranges of six different spotlight parrotfish that I tracked one month apart. So these are the plot on the left is the first set of tracks. The plot on the right is the second set of tracks. And each of those colors is a different individual. And the first thing you'll notice is that each of these home ranges, uh, they don't really overlap with each other at all. Right? So it seems like each of these males has priority access to that area. And there's very little sharing between, uh, between males. The other thing that you notice is that if you look at the track on the left and the track on the right, they're pretty much in the same location. So these home ranges and these core areas, shown here in the darker areas, 
are pretty much in the same location. And this is over a month, but I have some examples of, of much longer than that, five months to a year. Um, so these same individuals will occupy the same areas for long periods of time. All right, so following that study, I wanted to learn more about how uh, spatial interactions influence competition between parrotfishes. And so in 2021, I investigated spatial interactions among Caribbean parrotfishes uh, to test the hypothesis that parrotfish would avoid one another both statically, um, so spatially only, and as well as dynamically. And so I conducted this work in Bonaire. This is where I did all of my PhD work, so everything presented up to this point. I also did this in Bonaire. Um, for this particular study, I focused at, on two sites in the southern leeward coast of Bonaire, Aquarius and Invisibles. These two sites have relatively high coral cover, um, in some cases 20 to 40 percent coral cover uh, along the coast of Bonaire, uh, although that's changing currently with uh, the arrival of stony coral tissue loss disease. So it finally made its way to the island this year, and I went back recently, and it's not looking great. But at the time, lots of coral, very little macroalgae, um, and a really nice place to study these kinds of interactions. At each site, I conducted concurrent GPS tracking and behavioral observations of males and females of these four species. So we have the queen parrotfish, the princess parrotfish, stoplight, and red band parrotfish. Um, these tracks consisted of me video recording uh, the behavior of the fish underwater, while a snorkeler tracked the fish with a handheld GPS unit from the surface. The snorkeler is on the surface, staying right above the fish, tracking its movement, um, while I was recording behavior underwater. And as a quick plug for the field activity that I'll be doing on Tuesday, this is essentially what we're going to be doing. Um, we'll have you split up into groups. One person will snorkel at the surface with a GPS unit that I've uh, brought with me, and the rest of the group will go and record different behaviors of the parrotfish, and then later on I can put all that together and show you, show you what it looks like. Um, and you'll get a taste of that the rest of the talk. So, we tracked a total of 150 fish for approximately 20 minutes each, and that resulted in around 120 GPS relocations. So on the left here, I'm showing the relocations, the raw GPS data, for uh, several parrot uh, stoplight parrotfish. And each of these points represents a single GPS location for that fish. And each of these colors is a different fish. And you can already start to see the patterns just looking at the raw GPS data. So again, it doesn't look like the different individuals are overlapping in space very much. They seem to be using different uh, regions on the reef. And then we calculated or estimated these home ranges and core areas. So on the right, this is the same exact fish, but now you're looking at the home ranges that were computed from these GPS relocations. And the outlines are the uh, home range itself, and the darker shaded areas within that are the core areas. Those core areas are where the individual is spending most of its time. That's where it's doing most of its grazing and carrying out most of its activities. In addition to tracking the fish and, uh, and estimating these home ranges, we also quantified aggressive interactions. And this was to help us to understand um, why we saw the patterns we saw in the spatial interactions. So when we looked at overlap of home ranges and the probability of finding individuals within neighboring home ranges and things like that, we wanted to understand that by looking at the actual aggressive interactions. And so for each terminal phase male, each of these males, we quantified the number of interactions and the duration of those interactions. But because we paired this with GPS data, we were also able to estimate the location of each of those interactions within the home range. And so on the right here, this is a, uh, these are the home ranges for uh, several of the queen parrotfish. And you can see each of these points is a specific uh, aggressive interaction between parrotfish. And in this case, I'm showing only the uh, interactions with the same species, so with females and males of the same species. And then finally, we conducted separate simultaneous tracks of terminal phase male Sparisoma viridae, so the stoplight parrotfish, and terminal phase uh, male queen parrotfish to look at how dynamic interactions influence competition within these two competing species. And so for each pair, uh, we tracked them uh, simultaneously. We estimated their home range. We looked at the spatial overlap of those home ranges, and then we estimated uh, dynamic interactions using a dynamic interaction index that was developed by one of my collaborators in France. All right, so now I'm going to move into the results for this, uh, this particular study. 
So on the right here, I'm showing the home range area and the core area size, so in meters squared for each of the uh, uh, four different species that we looked at. Um, the colors are color coded by species. On the left, you have the princess. Uh, the pink is queen, the red is the red band, and the green is the stoplight parrotfish. And the darker color bars, those are the males. The lighter color bars are the females. And what we found was generally larger species use more space. They have larger home ranges and they have larger core areas. And you can see that in particular for the queen and the stoplight parrotfish, which I've outlined there. And you can see this more graphically if we look again at the home ranges. Uh, so on the left, we have queen parrotfish home ranges. And on the right, we have uh, princess parrotfish home ranges. And you can see that the larger queen parrotfish have much larger home ranges than the smaller Scarostaniopterus princess parrotfish. In addition to that, we found that the home ranges and core areas were much larger for males than for females. Again, this makes sense. Uh, the males are typically larger than the females, so we would expect them to use more space. And it isn't surprising because we know that home range size increases with body size in many animal species, not just parrotfish. But in parrotfish in particular, if we look at the home range size um, and plot that against the mass of the individual, so how, how big it is, um, the size of the home range increases very rapidly up to the point at maturity. And every fish that I tracked in this particular instance was larger than size at maturity, but we still got a body size effect um, when we looked at that. So next we looked at the spatial overlap of neighboring home ranges. So we wanted to see, uh, in this case, what the static interactions between species look like. And so the figure at the right is showing a heat map of the spatial overlap of the home ranges for the male parrot fishes that we tracked. Um, along the diagonal here, that's the overlap of uh, male home ranges of the same species. So uh, Sparisoma viride or the stoplight parrotfish with other stoplight parrotfish on the top left, or um, the princess parrotfish with other princess parrotfish in the bottom right. And then on the other side of that is the uh, overlap with neighboring home ranges of males of other species. And what we found was that there was very low overlap of male home ranges of the same species, but very high overlap or much higher overlap of home ranges of different species. So different species are sharing more space than individuals of the same species. And this is not surprising given that parrotfish are territorial, right? So there are, um, most of the interactions uh, that we see between the male focal parrotfish and other parrotfish are with individuals of the same species, either with females or with males. But the interactions with males tend to be more aggressive. So they happen more frequently, they're longer, and they're also more aggressive. They include these aggressive chases, like the one shown here, where different males will chase each other down the reef. It's a very energetically costly activity, um, but they will forcibly expel intruders from their territories. Additionally, these interactions occurred closest to the home range boundaries. So again, we're going back to looking at the map of the home ranges and the interactions with other uh, parrotfish here. And you can see that most of the open circle interactions, or sorry, the closed circle interactions, those are interactions with other males of the same species. Those occur really close to the boundary of each of these home ranges uh, pretty frequently, which indicates that these individuals are able to identify the intruders relatively quickly and expel them quickly. In contrast, the interactions between males and females of the same species tend to occur more within the home range itself in these core areas and are likely dominance interactions over foraging locations. So this, uh, these two plots here are showing the activity of males within the home ranges of other individuals. Right? So on the left, this is activity within the home ranges of other individuals. On the right, this is activity within core areas of other individuals. And what we found was that this differed by species, but the main uh, pattern to note here, and the one that I'm going to talk about the most, is for princess parrotfish down here. They were more likely to be found in the home ranges and core areas of other species than vice versa. So they were more often found in those areas, in the home range and core areas of other species. And this might explain why we saw um, these princess parrotfish engage in more interactions than any other species because they're unable to uh, be outside of those areas and partition that space very well, they tend to interact more with other species. 92% um, of the interactions that we recorded with other species uh, included 
uh, princess parrotfish, and 78% of those interactions between males of different species were with princess parrotfish. So they are not able to partition space very well, and as a result are interacting much more with other individuals. So competition is much higher, interference competition is much higher, which could have uh, implications for understanding how they coexist with these other species. And then finally, we looked at the dynamic interactions between males of uh, the stoplight and queen parrotfish. So again, an example of this on the right. So each of those lines moving around, those are the two different fish moving simultaneously. Uh, and I've also plotted the home range and core areas for those two individuals. And what we found uh, was that two pairs showed some avoidance uh, within shared space. So they were avoiding each other somewhat. And those two pairs were the two pairs that shared the most space. So in this particular instance, um, can't see it super well, but the dotted lines there represent the core areas for those two individuals. The pink is the queen and the green is the stoplight. Uh, those core areas pretty much overlap. And so these two individuals seem to be avoiding each other because they share a lot of the same space and they're using a lot of the same space. So this kind of interference competition can be important for understanding how these species that do compete for the same resources coexist. And so these two species in particular do uh, forage in a lot of the same areas. So both species tend to graze on uh, epilithic turfs and crustose coral and algae, and they do so on dead coral and pavement substrates. So they're foraging in the same locations, and we do oftentimes see interactions between these two species. So in this case, uh, stoplight parrotfish moves in on this queen while it's grazing and then ends up chasing the queen off um, to have access to that foraging area by itself. And so this dynamic avoidance could help to limit these kinds of interactions and allow these, these potentially competing species to limit that competition. All right, so we've talked a lot about territoriality and how territorial males are using space on the reef, but not all males are territorial. Um, some of them, as you can see here, forage in groups. So this is stoplight parrotfish, these are males. Um, and these are group males. So these group males move around in the shallows. Um, and you can, you know, shallow is a few centimeters. You'll see their tails sticking up out of the water sometimes. And they do so in these areas with low resource abundance. So it doesn't make sense to be territorial if the resources you're defending are so dispersed that you'd have to, spend a huge er uh, to defend a huge area. So they tend to forage together. Um, and other individuals are non-territorial, what we call floaters. So these individuals are moving around by themselves and vying for space on the reef slope. They're trying to establish their own territories. And that's gonna be the focus of the next part of the talk. So during the prior study, I had made observations that the territorial males um, tended to interact differently with neighboring males than they did with these non-territorial intruders, these non-territorial floater males. So I conducted additional observations of their behavior to test for this. So territoriality arises when the benefits of maintaining territory and priority access to resources outweighs the cost of defending those resources. And game theory predicts that escalated more aggressive competition or contests should be avoided when possible, especially when they can result in large energetic costs and sometimes even death. Um, territory defense is costly and impaired fishes leads to reduced body conditions, so you'd think that these males would want to reduce how often they're engaging in these escalated contests. And in many territorial species, neighbor-stranger dynamics help to do just that. So um, they allow the territorial individuals to focus their aggression on the greatest relative threat to their territory ownership. And during our initial observations of Sparisoma viridae, um, the stoplight parrotfish, we observed what appeared to be deer enemy effects. And these effects are essentially when the males interact more aggressively with unfamiliar intruders, these non-territorial floaters, uh, and less aggressively with neighbors that they know that already have established territories nearby. And we tested for this by observing 10 uh, stop, male stoplight parrotfish at our two study sites. We recorded the duration of every interaction with other males. We recorded the level of aggression shown. So these uh, interactions will tend to be either displays where individuals will flare their fins out um, and they just make themselves look larger, but they don't really chase each other. But they can also include these aggressive chases. 
And then we recorded whether or not the interactor was a neighbor or a non-territorial floater, so a non-territorial individual. And so this figure here is showing box plots of the number of interactions uh, between um, neighbors and floaters with the focal males um, and the duration of those interactions. And we didn't find any significant difference in the number or duration of the interactions between neighbors and floaters uh, for these, these territorial males, but we did find that the level of aggression shown towards these non-territorial individuals was much higher than it was for the neighbors. And this was also backed up by observations of neighbors foraging right next to each other and not interacting at all. Um, and we only ever saw that happen once with the non-territorial individuals. As soon as they're spotted, they got chased more, more often than not. In all but one interaction, we saw that happen. And sometimes it's kind of a pinball effect where one individual starts chasing a non-territorial individual, then the neighbor joins in, and then eventually that non-territorial individual is just... <laughs> just keeps going down the reef, getting chased by everything. Um, so it's not a great way to live. And because of these severe interactions, it seems to affect how these non-territorial individuals are using the reef and how they're moving around on the reef. And so we were able to opportunistically track a couple of these non-territorial individuals. So same thing, we had a GPS unit on the surface and we followed it. Um, and for both of the individuals that we tracked, they're shown here in the green lines, so on the right here, I have the map of all of the home ranges for the territorial individuals um, at one of my sites. And in the green, those tracks are the uh, non-territorial individuals that we tracked in those same locations. And one of those individuals was able to maintain uh, its position in the boundary of those territories the entire time. The other individual moved around those boundaries um, without going into them for most of the track until it was spotted by uh, one of the territorial individuals and chased off. And that red there is when it was being chased away by those territory holders. So it does seem that these individuals are moving primarily within the buffer zones between territories and that these zones may act as some sort of spatial refugia, allowing them to have a place on the reef without having to interact so much with these territorial individuals. And so the deer enemy effects allow territory holders to direct their aggression at the greatest perceived threat, in this case, the non-territorial floaters. Um, and limiting aggression against neighbors may help to reduce the cost of maintaining territory. So it might be a mechanism by which these parrotfish are able to be territorial without the costs outweighing the benefits of, of maintaining those territories. We found that the floaters moved within the boundaries of the territories to avoid conflict. Um, and the ability to stay within these boundaries may actually help them to obtain a territory in the future. So in studies of birds, including the oyster catcher uh, shown here on the right, um, individuals that are able to maintain in those boundaries and familiarize themselves with the neighbors and with the boundaries of those territories are more likely to be able to occupy vacancies as they open up. So they're, um, they're positioning themselves to then at some point take over one of these territories and have a territory of their own. Um, we have some evidence that this might be occurring with parrotfish, but we need a lot more data before I can say too much there. But we did have one switch in territory ownership of a, a territory while I was doing these tracks. Um, the territory stayed in exactly the same place. The new individual just took over the territory. So it didn't change how it was using space. And by understanding, probably by knowing where those boundaries were, it was able to just maintain those boundaries and not uh, conflict with the neighbors too much as it moved in. All right, so I'm gonna conclude my talk uh, by discussing some of future research directions. One of the things that I'm really interested in is how animal movement may mediate species interactions, and I've already talked about that a little bit, but I'm interested in this feedback between the movement itself and the environment. And using parrotfish as an example, how does the space use itself affect delivery of key reef functions? All right, so parrotfish are important grazers. They maintain this bare crop substrate. But how does the movement and that space use influence the delivery of that, that reef function? And so you can imagine as a fish is moving around its territory, defending the boundaries, and you get these nice uh, buffer zones between territories where the individuals kind of avoid, so they're not interacting with one another, that you might see more grazing within the center. That might lead to increased coral recruitment. You might see varying spatial dynamics and what settles and recruits to the reef. And so to, to study this, I conducted a recruitment experiment where I put out coral recruitment tiles on the reef um, in different locations within home ranges and collected them about a year later to look at these patterns 
Um, still analyzing that data. There's a lot of data. Um, but hopefully at some point be able to share that as well. But these are the kinds of general things that I'm interested in. So how is that movement space use then translating to uh, those functional uh, roles of these animals on the reef? I'm also interested in how uh, human uh, changes are affecting how animals are moving, how they're using space, and therefore their, um, their roles on reefs. And this can occur through direct effects on the focal individual itself. So it can change how the animal is perceiving its environment. Uh, maybe it's too warm. Uh, and that changes how it's moving on the reef or why it's moving on the reef. But it can also indirectly affect the external uh, environment of that animal and then affect resource uh, or space use in that way. So here, if we look at an example of coral bleaching. So as corals bleach, live coral dies. That new dead coral substrate then becomes colonized by other things. And typically, that's epilithic turfs that are dominated by cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are the main component of parrotfish diets. So we might expect that as you increase the resource that those parrotfish use, you might see a reduction in the size of the space that they're using. Right? If there's more resources, there's no need to defend such a large area. So you might actually be able to get increased populations of parrotfishes because their space use can become constrained to some extent by the increase in the resources. So understanding how these benthic shifts may be influencing space use and movement can tell us a lot about um, both the population dynamics of these uh, species, but also the community dynamics. Because as the space use shifts, you might see shifts in how they interact with one another. And I haven't just been studying the effects of humans on reef fish. I've also recently been working uh, with a group that's studying loggerhead sea turtles. Um, so for my role in this project, I've gone out to a place called Crystal River in Florida. That's a, a nice spot where you find tons of sea turtles. Um, and we go out on boats and we go around, we look for turtles, we quantify their abundances. When we see a big enough turtle, we follow it and we jump on it, we pull it up onto the boat, um, we take a bunch of samples, uh, uh, scoot and biopsy samples to look at what it's been eating, do some stable isotope analysis. But we're also attaching these cameras to the backs of the turtles. Um, and these cameras are special. So not only do they have a high definition camera that allows us to visualize different behaviors, they also have a sensor package inside that allows us to quantify fine scale uh, movement and space use. And so on the right over there, um, I've plotted a 24 hour time series of movement and space use for one loggerhead shown up here at the top. So on the top plot, it's just the depth across time. So it's how deep that turtle is through time. So that's obtained through a pressure sensor. So you can see that at the beginning, it dives pretty deep. And then it comes pretty shallow during the nighttime. Um, and then it goes relatively deep in the morning again. Um, the middle plot is showing the dynamic body acceleration. This is a proxy for energy expenditure. So the higher the peaks there, the more energy it's expending. So you can see that at the beginning of that 24-hour duration, it's using a lot more energy than at the end. Um, and the bottom plot is showing the uh, rotational activity, so how much that animal is turning. And these data are collected at the scale of 20 samples per second. So we're getting 20 samples per second on each of these different um, axes, and it's telling us a lot about that animal's movement. And one thing that we're really interested in is how uh, vessel interactions are influencing movement and space use of these sea turtles. So we've been looking at how the number of dives how the dive time, how bottom distance, which is a, a proxy for how much the animal's foraging, um, and the maximum depth of those animals changes as a function of scallop season. So in the scallop season, there's a lot more vessels. Outside of scallop season, there's a lot, uh, uh, much fewer, many fewer vessels on the water. And what we found is that generally, it seems like the number of dives, the time of those dives um, decrease or sorry, the number of dives decrease, the time that they're diving increases, so they're staying down for longer. Um, they're more active at the bottom, and the depth is much deeper, so they're going deeper. And this seems to be an avoidance response. They're trying to avoid vessel traffic, um, and they're wary of the boats. So this is what I'm working on currently. Um, but with that, I'd like to take any questions. Uh, thank a lot of funding sources and things like that for helping me out with this. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. I had a question about the territorial boundaries. Okay. Do the floaters have to learn them, or is there some kind of a marking mechanism? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, he asks if the about the territorial boundaries, are they learned or is there some sort of marking that alerts the individuals to those boundaries? Um, we don't actually know. I'm not sure is the, is the honest answer. My guess is that there's some form of spatial memory so that through interaction with these territory holders, they learn those boundaries. So as they're moving around and they get chased off one time, they're like, eh, that's a spot I shouldn't go in the future. And they're able to learn those boundaries that way. Um, there has been some speculation that, if, at least in uh, the stoplight parrotfish, which does sometimes target and graze live coral, that that live uh, grazing on live coral could be a mechanism of marking those boundaries. But there's no real evidence of that. So we don't, we're not sure on that front. It's a good question. So does that mean that the territory is only restricted by food or also by how many females they're going to have to defend? Because in a smaller area, you also have fewer females. Yep, that's a good question. So the question was, um, I, I had had a plot up there about how coral bleaching might affect resource abundance and how that influences space use. And the question is, um, is our resources the only thing that are determining that space use or is it also determined by things like uh, female abundance? Um, and uh, contender abundance. And so the answer to that is that that plot was just me, hypothetically, if we had a coral bleaching event and there were an increase in resources, that would be the expected response, is that they wouldn't have to defend so much area. Um, there have been studies that have looked at the uh, effect of number of females, and that does influence space use. So it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, they're defending these areas because they they have access to resources in those areas, but they have to defend enough for that harem as well um, to some extent. So as that harem increases, it's more mouths to feed, so to speak. So it's likely that that will increase the amount of space they need as well. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah, related to them, actually. Um, so if the reef degrades and there's more algae and potentially more food for them, just the density of the parrot fish might be yeah, so the question is, uh, as the reef degrades and there's more potential food resources, does that uh, potentially increase the number of parrotfish, right? Yeah. Um, the sh short answer is yes, briefly. So after some bleaching events, there have been increases in parrotfish on some reefs uh, in the Indo-Pacific in particular. Um, so it does seem like the, number, the amount of resources could influence the number of fish, obviously. Um, not sure how long that would persist, right? Because as the reef continues to degrade, Parrotfish are not good at removing the macroalgae that develops on those reefs. So after they've transitioned to that macroalgal state, they're not doing a whole lot to remove that macroalgae because um, it's not very nutritionally valuable to them. Um, other things do, uh, but parrotfish are not at that point. So I guess it depends on how long <laughs> it persists in that early state um, and if the parrotfish are able to keep up with that and, and maintain those cropped early states that they like to, to consume. Yeah. Uh, question then? I think I would ask my question in another direction. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Do the uh, members of the harem tend to stick with the same male or do they migrate from one territory to another? That's also a great question because there are some really fun interactions I've observed. So the question is um, do the members of the harem, the females in the harem, tend to stick in, in the same areas as the males? Uh, short answer is yes, they do. Uh, the members of the harem tend to stay in those areas, but we do get occasional interactions where an, an, uh, a female will come into the territory, and it's very obvious that it shouldn't be there because the male will chase it out, um, sometimes repeatedly, and that will sometimes lead to aggressive interactions from neighboring males. So there is some, uh, some overlap of space use between the, ma uh, the females and the, and the males. Uh, they don't stay in exactly the same area, but typically they share a lot of space with the males. <laughs> uh, the question is, what is the lifespan of a parrotfish? And uh, thankfully, I looked this up the other night after somebody asked what the lifespan of a shark was. Uh, right now, the oldest living uh, parrotfish of a specific species in the Indo-Pacific, and there's only a few that they've, they've done these kinds of studies with, um, is like eight years. So I, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it uh, probably male because the males are the oldest. They transition after maturity or like 
after a certain size class. Um, so it's likely a male, but not entirely sure on that. And uh, there have been some studies that suggest they could live upwards of 20 years, but we don't actually know. Yeah. Um, if a male dies, loses its territory, is the replacement male for that territory likely to be one of the floaters, or will one of the uh, females transition to the terminal phase? So that's a, another great question. Um, we don't know. And, and again, this is why I'm so interested in this particular study system. Parrotfish are great for this because they have this territorial behavior. So the question was, um, sorry, I didn't repeat the question. So the question is, if a male dies, is it replaced by a female that transitions to a male, or is it replaced by one of these floaters or another neighboring male? And the answer is, yeah, we don't know. Um, in other territorial systems like this, uh, sometimes that vacancy is just pushed in on by the surrounding neighbors. They'll expand their territories to, to take up some of that space. Um, sometimes floater males will come in and take over those areas. And it's possible, I guess, that, that a transitioning female could take over that area. I'm not sure if we've ever seen that happen with parrotfish, so I can't say for sure, but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So the question is why? What is the big picture of why this is important? And if I wanted to pitch this to a big funding agency, how would I get funded? Uh, answer that is like multi there are multiple ways you could pitch this. One is that you could use these as like a canary in the coal mine kind of situation, um, whereas the reef is degrading, we could look at the influence of that degradation on the population structure and the community structure of the parrotfish. Um, and I think that'd be a strong way to, to pitch this. You can also pitch it from a purely behavioral standpoint. This is really interesting behavior. There's a lot of uh, potentially sexual selection and things to do with evolution going on here that, that could be interesting to study. Um, yeah, so there are multiple ways you could pitch this. I think the, the big way is that um, parrotfish are important for the reef function and health and understanding how they're moving and interacting and coexisting will help us to understand how that, how that function is delivered to the reef and how that might help us to understand how shifts in reef uh, benthic composition um, may affect parrotfish space use, but also be affected by um, that space use. So, feedbacks. Uh, listen, uh, yep. How high are the chances for the port to the reef on the territory? Yeah, sorry, repeat that. How high are the chances for the port to the reef on the um, territory? Sorry, one, one more time. <laughs> My bad. Get rid of it. Oh, fertility. Yeah. Got you. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, so the question is what's the probability of fertility for uh, the males on the reef, I assume, in the territories? Um, I don't know the exact number, but it is much higher for the territorial males than it is for group males or these non territorial floaters. So they do tend to interact uh, or mate more often in these territories than they do elsewhere. I don't know the exact probability, but it's pretty high. <laughs> They'll mate several times a day um, throughout the day. There's no real period. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a pelagic spawning. So so they go up into the water column, and you'll see them sometimes. Um, other other wrasses will do this. So parrotfish are related to wrasses. They'll go up into the water column, and they do. I call it a mating spiral. They go up in the water column, and they spin around each other, and then they split off, and they expel the eggs and the sperm into the water column, and it's fertilized there. Yeah. Pretty cool. Any other questions? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you for Long Hall for hosting, and if you guys could help us move the chairs and clear out so we could move the tables back to set up the restaurant, that would be great. Thank you. Don't forget the restaurant. <laughs> I did that earlier. Rebel take us $5.